you've got faith, expectation has to be a part of that. Because if you really believed that you received something, you should be looking for it every day. That's called expectation. Psalm 5.3, a really good verse you ought to remember. It says, In the morning, O Lord, I make my request known to you, and then I wait with expectation. Good verse, Psalm 5.3. That's not what we're teaching on tonight. Hallelujah. That's, 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 a, that's a freebie. <laughs> well, let's pray, and we're going to jump into our teaching. Father, we love you tonight. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you, the God of the universe, knows each of us by name. You know us intimately, and yet you still love us unconditionally. We rejoice in that tonight, Lord. And we just ask now for the help of the Holy Spirit as we break open the bread of life. May the words tonight reach each of us and, and challenge us and help us grow, help us to learn more about you and your kingdom and how you and the life that you want for us, Lord. So we just turn this time over to you now and ask for the help of the Holy Spirit throughout the evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So tonight, we are going to start a series that we will be doing through the month of February on you know, how to live the abundant life or living the abundant life. Because here, here's the thing. If you look at the church as a whole, and this is not a criticism, it's just an observation, okay? I mean, it, I'm, I'm just talking reality. I like being real. If you look at the church as a whole, I would say that the majority of those who are in the church are not living a victorious life. And we, you know, and, and, and hey, there's areas of my life that I'm still working to maybe be more victorious in. So I'm not, you know, we're all at different places. We're all start at different spots. We all have growth potential. But we need to ask ourselves, if we know God wants us to have the abundant life, why are we not experiencing it fully, to its fullest? Where are we missing it? Because guess what? He's not missing it. <laughs> he's, he's, he's done everything he's going to do. And in his kingdom, he's got this big treasure house, and he's just waiting for us to tap into it. And so what I want to do with this series, I want to make this series really practical. Um, you know, we're going to dig into the Word, and, and, and of course that's always important, and we want to make sure that we're being true to Scripture and, 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 and being led by the Holy Spirit. But see, I, I don't know about you, but you know, sometimes I'll listen to a message, and I'm like, okay, that's great. Now, how do I put that in my life? Now, one thing I love about Pastor Paul is, almost, I mean, all of his teaching is so practical. It's something you can walk out of that door and put into practice right then. And you can't say, you know, that's not true of everyone. And again, not criticizing, I'm just saying that, you know, that's where I want to be. I want to give you some nuggets tonight that you can go home tonight and begin to say, you know what, I'm going to start doing that. Yeah. And then over the next several weeks, we're going to go continue to explore this topic of living the abundant life. Because know this, you were in the kingdom of darkness. The minute you ask Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior, to come into your heart, make you born again, a recreated spirit, you changed kingdoms. The Bible says that he took you from the kingdom of darkness and placed you into the kingdom of his dear son. Or some translations, which I like to say, the kingdom of the son of his love. So once you became a Christian, you left the old kingdom and came into a new kingdom. One of the reasons I believe that Christians aren't living the abundant life is that they're still trying to utilize the laws, so to speak, of the old kingdom and make them work in the new kingdom. And the new kingdom has a completely set of, different set of laws. I mean, think about it. I mean, one simple one is this. In this kingdom, okay, I've got... $10 left, man. I better save that because I don't know what I'm going to do to the end of the week. Okay? That's, this, that's, that's the, the cursed earth system. It was called the Babylonian system. But in this kingdom over here that we're in now, Lord, I have $10. You said in your word that if I give, it'll be given back to me. I believe you're leading me to sow this as a seed to this person. And I believe I receive a hundredfold back. And then the next thing you know, you do that, and somebody shows up, and you're in the grocery store, and you know what? God told me to give you $200. I don't know why. I don't even know you here. That's how his kingdom works. See? Different. 
And so what we have to do is we've got to move out of the realm of here, as pastors, you know, pastors taught a lot on this, we've got to get out of the soul realm into the spirit realm to let it influence how we think. So as our mind is renewed to these truths, we can begin to, to live the abundant life, okay? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse 10. Jesus is comparing himself to the thief. We all know who the thief is, right? Satan, the devil, Hasatan in the Hebrew. Hasatan, the accuser of the brethren. And by the way, his name, his name, is, not, his, his name is not Satan. Satan's a title, by the way. And when you write Satan, don't ever capitalize it. Put a little S, you know what I'm saying? I've oh, got time for that mess. So in John, John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. So there's an answer to a question right there. When you look around the world and you see things being stolen, things being killed, and things being destroyed, you know it's not God. Why in the world did God let that hurricane hit those? God didn't put the, do that hurricane. That wasn't him. Why did God do that earthquake over the... That, 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 no, uh -uh. he didn't do that. He didn't do that. We live in a fallen world. And the Apostle Paul told us that the, this world right now, yes, yeah, God owns this planet. There's no doubt about it. But right now, Satan is the God of this world. He has... He, Adam turned over authority in the earth to him. Now, his time's running out. Because you can read in the book of Revelation, God's got the title deed. And, and it's only a matter of time for Satan's lease runs out on this earth and God's plan is fulfilled. But in the meantime, all he wants to do is steal, kill, and destroy. He hates you. He absolutely hates you. And if he can't keep you from becoming a Christian, he wants to keep you defeated in life. Okay? He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life. And listen and that they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus said, here, man, here, here, right here. This is why I am here. I've come to give you life, but not just any regular life. Life lived in abundance or filled to the overflow. Are you living in the overflow right now? I mean, in some ways I am, but boy, there are other areas I'm like, okay, where's the overflow, <laughs> right? Okay, what, what, what do I need to do to tap into it? That's what I want to help you learn how to do. I want to help you learn how to take these spiritual truths and put them into action. Okay, before we leave here, though, I do want to look at a couple of different translations. I wanted you to just listen to these. Um, in the Amplified, it says, Jesus says, The thief only comes in order to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. It's nice. Okay, now listen to this one. This is the New Living Translation. Jesus says, The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Woo! Good stuff. And one last one. This is the Passion Translation. A thief has only one thing in mind. He wants to steal, slaughter, and destroy. But I have come to give you Everything in abundance, more than you expect, life in its fullness until you overflow. Now, that's good stuff now. That's the heart of God speaking, folks. Forget this old religious tradition that God wants you broke and God wants you miserable. And he wants you busted and disgusted because he wants to see you grovel. No. Did he send his only son to die a horrible death so for you to live like that or for me to live like that? No, he wants us to enjoy life and the rewards of the price paid by his dear son on the cross. Because on that cross, he bore your sin. On that cross, he bore your sickness and disease. On that cross, he bore your poverty. On that cross, he bore every possible bad thing you can imagine. So he has redeemed you from that. He has redeemed you from that. All right, so let's turn over to 2 Peter, and we're going to be in 2 Peter chapter 1, and 
Now I'm telling you, I'm going I'm to make a bold statement, okay? If you can grab hold of this, I'm not saying necessarily, you know, you, you, you get it all tonight, but if you can get the gist of this and begin to meditate on this and begin to study this and just and read over it daily, it has the capacity to change your life if you grab hold of it. See, you got to get a revelation of what the Word says is yours. And don't let some talking head convince you otherwise. All, we heard the song earlier tonight. All his promises are what? Yes and amen. You know what I heard growing up? When you pray, there's three answers. God will either say yes, no, or wait. The Bible doesn't say that. <laughs> it says yes and amen. There's no no in there. You know, that's religion. That's religion, tr religious tradition, you know? All right. So, in 2 Peter chapter 1, let's look at verse 3. help if I got over there. I was in First Peter. Okay, so we're going to read through this and then we're going to break it down. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, that's really wordy, and I get that. So what I did was I broke it down for you, and I don't know if you can see it or not. Pastor, do you notice I'm kind of, kind of, thing kind of warped up? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. So we've got five things right here that, that you just need to get tattooed in your brain. <laughs> All things, knowledge of him, precious promises, partners of the divine nature, and escaping corruption. When you begin to see how these five work together, you will begin to tap into the abundant life. So let's take a look. Starting in verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things. Or did he say some things? Or did he say a few things? Or did he say every now and then things? All things. You know one thing I've done in my Bible? I, all throughout my Bible, every time I see the word all, I circle it. So if you look at my Bible, just flip through the page, you'll see all these little circles. All, 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 all. Because I want it just to be impressed upon my mind. When he says all, he means all. He, he's not putting any limits on it. See, we put limits on it. Man puts limits on it. God does not. He says, Peter tells us, by his divine power, he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What pertains to life? Everything. Your health. Your welfare. Your well-being. Your relationships. Your finances. All of those are things that pertain to life. And the Bible says that he has given us all those things. Do you believe that tonight? Do I believe that tonight? Yeah. We need to believe that tonight. Because if you can't get past step one, none of this is going to matter. You have got to be convinced in your mind that he has given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. Anything you need in this life, you have. Why? Because we're living in a different kingdom now. Do you understand that? Do you understand now? Think of it this way. Think of it this way. If, if I were to take one of you and blindfold you, put you in an airplane, fly you overseas somewhere, and drop you off in the middle of a country you had no idea where you were, took the blindfold off and said, see ya, and left you alone, and now here you are in this foreign land, in this different kingdom, and you're trying to speak English and nobody understands you. You're trying to pull out American money and nobody will take it. You're, you're trying to use body language and you don't know, but in their, their culture, the thing you thought was a, a good gesture, it's, a, it's, an, it's an insult. And, you're, and you just can't figure anything out. Folks, it's the same thing. You're in a different kingdom now. 
there are different laws and different rules in the kingdom of God than there are in this earth. And we have to learn what those are so we can operate effectively in that kingdom. See, when you became born again, the Bible says that you are now seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. You're not a citizen of this world anymore. You're a citizen of heaven. But God said, you know what, though? I've got an assignment for you. I'm, you're an ambassador. I'm putting you, I want you to stay in the earth to be an ambassador for my kingdom. Just like we send ambassadors to other nations, you know, we say, hey, this is the ambassador, ambassador to Saudi Arabia or the American ambassador to Italy or whatever. You're an ambassador for the kingdom of heaven. And those ambassadors stay in the U.S. embassy in that country. And according to international law, if the U.S. embassy is right here in the middle of whatever country, Germany, Japan, or whatever, that's considered American soil. They brought American kingdom to that country. When you live here, we are to bring the kingdom of heaven into this world because that's where our citizenship is. And see, we have a totally different language than this world does. This world says, seeing is believing. What does the kingdom say? Believing is seeing. Woo! 180 degree difference, right? You got to believe before you see. This kingdom says, survive, survive, survive. This kingdom says, lay your life down for my sake and you'll live. I mean, it's a total opposite. It's a completely new and different way of thinking. And we're going to get more into that in the coming weeks. But for right now, you have to grab hold of this. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Okay? How do we find out what these things are? The next step. Through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue. So, He's given me all things. How do I find out what those all things are? Through the knowledge of him. How do I get that knowledge of him? By doing what you're doing tonight. Listening at the word. Listening to the word. Whether it's in church, whether you're at home, whether you're in your car, wherever. You're taking, see, he sent you to earth, but he didn't leave you without something. He said, oh, by the way, here's your manual. You know what Bible stands for? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Basic instructions before leaving earth. So whatever you want to know about the kingdom of God, you just got to open this up and say, okay, Lord, now, I know you gave me all things. Let me find out what really those all things are. And I begin reading. And I find out, man, Jesus has provided divine help for me. I don't have to be sick. Now, some of you tilted on that one. I don't have to be sick. He paid the price for my healing and my health. So th I've learned that through the Bible. That's one of the things he's provided. Now what I got to do to get that? He said he meets all my needs. He says I own the whole estate. Book of Galatians. He says you own the whole estate. The whole, ki the whole kingdom's yours. You know, a good picture of that. Do you remember this, the, the story of the prodigal son? I mean, it's a great story about, you know, people who maybe fall away and come running back to the Lord. But there's a, there's a secondary meaning there also. See, the son, you can think of, the, think of the son as Adam. He's in father's house, the Garden of Eden. He has everything. But he stumbles and he decides, well, you know, that, that apple does look pretty good. I want that. Well, what did the prodigal son do? He said, you know... I'm going to leave my father's house and go out and see what this world has to offer. Prodigal son leaves. He comes to the end of his being. No money, nothing to do. He's so hungry, he's laying in hog slop, eating the husks, the corn husks that the hogs are eating. And all of a sudden, he has this, uh, this thought, you know what? Man, even the servants in my father's house we're doing better than this. I, I, I'm going to go back to my father, and I'm going to tell him, Father, I've sinned against you. I don't even expect you to welcome me back. Just let me be a servant so I can have a roof over my head and something to eat. But the Bible says, as the son was heading home, the father was out looking. And it doesn't say this, but it, gives the, it, it implies that the father has been doing this every day. Where's my son? Is he coming home today? Is he coming home today? Is he coming home today? 
He's out there every day looking for his son. And all of a sudden, in the distance, one day, he sees his son coming. Now, in this kingdom, in the earth-cursed kingdom, you know, an ungodly father would say, Yeah, I knew you'd come back, you old sorry thing. I figured, yeah. Not in the kingdom of God. Jesus made a way for us to come back. Remember I said, like, think about this Adam. So that's mankind. Mankind now has got to come back to God. And what does God do? Does he say, see there, you dirty old rotten sinner? I need you to come groveling back. The Bible says he said, first of all, he embraced his son. Now you've got to think about this in the Jewish culture. Pigs were unclean. And for this man to hug his son who had been in hog slop made him unclean. But what was he doing? He was taking his uncleanness and giving him his righteousness. Okay? And then he said, okay, get the finest robe we have and put it on my boy. Whew. He then said, get a ring and put it on his finger. Wasn't just any ring. It was a signet ring which said, my son now has the same authority in my house as I do. He can sign legal documents. He can make legal transactions. And he stamps it with the ring I gave him, and it's law. Are you getting the picture? Yeah. He then does this. He says, get a pair of sandals for his feet. In that culture, when, like in our culture, when you shake your hand, somebody's hand, you come to an agreement. Okay, let's shake on it. Yes, okay, we are in agreement. We have a, a verbal contract. You know, back in the day, that was more binding than a written contract. People don't, you know, not now. In that culture, when you exchange sandals, it was the same thing as a handshake. He was basically saying, I'm making a legal transaction to tell you everything I have is yours. That's us coming into the Father's kingdom. Here's a robe of righteousness. Here's my ring of authority. Here is my agreement that everything I have is yours, the sandals. And then he says, now, go, let's throw a party. <laughs> my son was dead, but now he's alive. So when you understand, that's the all things we're talking about. But you don't know that unless you find it in here. And you find it in here by, again, coming to church, coming to Bible study, reading the Bible for yourself, listening to tapes and CDs, but spending time learning what's in your manual. You know, I told the fellows here from um, Stop Addiction New England, I was honored very much by Kevin and Mike to be able to come and share a Bible study with them the other week. And I told them that I was on a job one time, and um, I had vision insurance that I didn't even know. I worked there for five years, didn't even know I had vision coverage. What good did it do me if I didn't know? And it wasn't until my son started saying, Dad, I think I might need, you know, things looking blurry. So I said, well, let me check into this. And I called the, the you know, the human resource. You've got a vision plan. You get free eye exams every year. <laughs> Who knew, right? That's where too many Christians are. They don't know what's in here. They don't have the knowledge of him concerning all the things they have. When you get that, your life will change because you won't settle. Because when the devil starts whispering in your ear, see, you're broke. You'll never amount to anything. Oh, no, 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 no. In, my king in this kingdom, I've already got a crown. I've got a seat up there next to Jesus. I'm just over here because he said I've got to stay here and do some work for him. <laughs> but I'm going to be sitting up there with him. heard somebody say one time, yeah, Jesus has got his throne, and there's a little metal folding chair next to him. No! He's not going to have a throne and then have you sit in a little metal folding chair because he said, I am the king of kings. Who's the of kings that he's the king over? Us. He's the big K king. We're the little K king. He's the big L Lord. We're the little L Lord. That's where we are. And when you begin to understand who you are in Christ Jesus and that you have all things through the knowledge of him, now we're ready to go to the next step. Now we're ready to take the signet ring that I just spoke about. Let's read it. It says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. 
So when I, have the, when I understand he's given me all things, and I've learned what those things are, now I'm going to go find my legal right, the precious promises to those things. And if it's written in here, as we said earlier, all his promises are yes and amen. All his promises are yes and amen. If he says, my brothers, above all things, that's pretty high, right? Above all things, I want you to be in health and prosper even as your soul prospers. Straight from the mouth of the Apostle John as being led by the Holy Spirit. My prayer for you, above anything else, that's pretty high. Above anything else, I want you to be in health and I want you to prosper, even as your soul prospers. Why do we need to be in health and prosper? So we can advance the kingdom in the earth. If you're sick, you can't do anything. If you're broke, you can't do anything. We live in an economic world. It takes money to put Christian television on. It takes money to send missionaries to other countries. So God wants us to have health and prosper so we can advance his kingdom. Or in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, it's the Lord your God who gives you the power to get wealth to establish his covenant. Or another way to say that, to establish his legal rights in the earth. Whoa. I'm about to preach myself happy. I'm telling you what. Okay, so what are some of the precious promises? Well, the Bible's full of them. The Bible's full of them. And all you've got to do is follow kingdom guidelines to access them. So let's, let's say, for example, okay, come home one night, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, you start getting that tummy ache. Now, here, here's, here's, here's a self, here's a self check. Here's what you always do. What you always want to do. You want to, you want to, um, you always want to do a neck up checkup, okay? That's what we're going to do right now. We're going to do a neck up checkup. This is no condemnation. Please don't condemn yourself and don't answer out loud. When you get home and you begin to get sniffles start to prepare, ask yourself, don't say it out loud. Ask yourself, what is the first thing I do? Do I reach for a bottle of NyQuil or whatever else? Do I look for my doctor's phone number or do I go to the Word of God? Again, there's no condemnation. Because we're all at different places. When you get to the point where you're convinced that by his stripes you're healed, when those sniffles come out, the first thing that comes out of your mouth is, oh no, devil, oh no, not today. Not today. By his stripes I am healed. Jesus carried my sickness and bore my disease. Therefore, I don't have to. You spirit of infirmity, you get out of here and you leave me alone in Jesus' name. That's the first thing that comes out of your mouth. Guess what you just did? You just grabbed hold of the precious promise. You just grabbed hold of one of your legal rights in Jesus' name. Again, no condemnation because we're all different places. We're all some of you. This may be new to you. You've never heard this before. So yeah, you're gonna have to build your faith in that area, you know, And, and that's okay. But here's the thing. See, you begin doing that. The Bible talks about our, you know, putting on the 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 armor of God, so that we can stand in the evil day. See, every, every one of us, there's going to be an evil day that's going to come your way. And I'm going to tell you right now, if that evil day is diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, and you've been filling yourself through the word and building your faith, that, that, that comes out, first thing you go, like, whatever. But if you wait till then to say, oh, yeah, I remember, I heard that teaching. Let me start believing that now. Woo, you're in for a battle. It's kind of, think of it like this. If I, want to run, uh, if I want to run a marathon, am I going to go out tomorrow and run 26 miles? No. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to start training. And I'm going to run a couple miles or a mile or whatever. And I'm going to start building myself up. See what I'm doing? I'm building up my endurance. If you start, and especially you young people, oh my gosh, please hear me. If you start now speaking the word over yourself, laying hold of the promises concerning health, when you get to be my age, pfft, you don't have to worry about it. Long life's part of that too. See, the world says, well, 70, 80 years, that's, that's, that's what you've got to look forward to. The Bible says the days of man are 120. <laughs> Why aren't we living to 120? 
because we're not being told we can and we're not believing it and speaking it in our lives. And it doesn't mean 120 walking around with a cane humped over. It means like Moses. His eyes were not dim and his strength was not abated. He didn't die of some disease or some chariot wreck. It was time his life was over. And he said, okay, Lord, I've I've done my assignment. And he just stepped out of his body. Boom. That's how we're going to go. If you believe that those things have been provided through the knowledge of him and you grab hold of that precious promise. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him salvation. I speak that every day. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That's the words of God. Long life. Long life. Long life. Okay. So, when you find yourself in a situation, you, you got you to gotta, gotta find a promise that fits your, your situation or whatever you're going through, whether it's financial or relational, you know, um, health, whatever it is. But there's an answer for what you need in the manual. And you have a contractual right to it because he's given you the whole estate. Think of it this way. And I wish I would have brought one. I wish I had thought of this. If I, if, I, if I gave Pastor Paul a check for 100 bucks right now, would he say, wow, David, thank you. I thank you, I have, I thank you for the $100. He, that's what he would say. But does he really have $100? He's got the promise of $100. He's just got a piece of paper with my signature on it. But it's not until he cashes that at the bank. And how does he know it's good? Because it's got my signature on it, and he knows and he trusts me that I'm a man of honor, and I would, you know, I'm a man of my word. God has got a checkbook full of promises on there, and his name's already signed, and he's standing here waiting for you to come and get it. Come get the check and cash it. The check's here. The check's not in the mail. (laughs) It's here. (laughs) And the check's not hidden off somewhere. It's here. Come get it. You know? You know how bad I would feel if, because this is how so many people approach this. What if, I, what if my son, what if I went and grilled some really nice steaks and had some nice baked potato and, um, you know, some, some nice corn and some vegetables, just a real nice meal. And I said, okay, it's time to eat. And my son said, hey, Dad, um, if I go clean the garage real quick, can I come and sit at the table and eat tonight? Are you kidding? You're my son. You don't have to go do that. Come sit and enjoy the meal. That's what we do because we're still, our mind still thinks in the earth curse system. Well, maybe if I do this for God, he'll give me that promise. Maybe, maybe if I just give more money. Maybe if I fast for 10 days. You know, and all those things in and of itself are good things, but not to gain his favor. <laughs> That's not the, you already have his favor. You're the prodigal. He's already put the robe. He's giving you the ring. He didn't put it on with conditions. He didn't say, well, if you do this and do this this, you can have my promises. He said, you're my son. Now, we want to do those other things as the Holy Spirit leads us to, to grow and develop and those kind of things, but not to gain his favor. you got to get past that. Man, you know, I, that guy cut me off the other day, and I called him an idiot while I was driving. So now I guess God's mad at me, and he won't. No, just ask him to forgive you. He's going to forgive you. Guess what? He forgets about it. <laughs> Come back the next day. You know, Lord... I'm really sorry again. What are you talking about? I'm sorry, Lord. You know that guy? No, I don't know what you're talking about. He's already forgotten it, but not us. That's why we have to retrain our minds. That's why we have to get this more influenced from over here. Because remember, here you're perfect. You're righteous. Remember, righteousness is not something you get i mean something you earn is something that you're given freely if you're a christian here tonight you will never be more righteous than you are right now you're as righteous as you're ever going to be now we can grow in our conduct of you know holiness and that kind of thing being closer when i walk to the lord but as far as your standing with god you're where you i mean you can't get any better you, you already got a seat next to jesus at the throne how much more righteousness do you have to have? <laughs> right? All right. So, so we have all things through the knowledge of him, through his precious promises. And this next part is going to stretch you also. 
It says, we have these great and exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature. <clears throat> that word partaker also means a participant of the divine nature or a partner of the divine nature or an associate of the divine nature. So you have to understand, guys. You have to understand. Again, going back to this. When you become a Christian... The Holy Spirit comes into, you, comes into you. He takes your dead spirit. He doesn't, he doesn't fix your dead spirit. He gives you a brand new spirit. Now, from a scientific viewpoint, here's what we're talking about. You've got a spirit with human DNA. Now you've got supernatural DNA. They come together and make a new man called a Christian. The Bible says it's an original formation, something never seen before. It's a new species. Think about that. You're a new species called a Christian. That's now your spiritual genetic makeup. Okay? So you have this here, and as pastors talk to us about, we're living in this shell called a body, and in between that is our soul. And our soul's kind of mediating between the two. And we're, our job is to renew our mind to the truths that come from here. Because that's what's in this kingdom. This stuff is in the old kingdom we used to be in. See? And so when we follow those dictates, we're living under the laws and guidelines of the old kingdom. And he says, you're not a citizen of that world. Why are you trying to, you, you know, it, it doesn't work. Use this right here. But see, you have a choice. That's why he says that you can be partakers. I mean, you, you do partake and, and you're there. But as far as living it out, you can choose to participate with the divine nature or not. Does that make sense? So when you have these precious promises, it's still got to be a daily decision. And that's the focus of this message tonight. The first part of your journey is it's called the daily decision. This is the daily decision, and we'll, we'll, we're going to finish up on that in just a minute. You have to choose to partner or participate with that divine nature. See, you have a choice. That's, that's, what, that's what makes this so amazing. God could have made us robots. He could have made us automatons. He could have made us mindless orcs, <laughs> for those of you who have seen Lord of the Rings. You know, just do what we're told and just march around. But he didn't want that. He wanted someone who would willingly and of their own volition say, I choose to worship you. I choose to live for you. I choose to spend my days learning about you and fellowshipping with you. That's what he wants. He wants, he wants you as an act of your will to be a part of his kingdom. He don't want to force anything on you. So that's why he makes these promises conditional. You can take them or you can't. Or, or not, either way, you know? And it's funny because if you look at Jesus all throughout the Gospels, anytime he encountered someone when he told them the answer to their question or here's what you need to do, every case where the person said, hmm, okay, whatever, and turned and walked off, he never chased after him. Did he? He never chased after him. Why? Because he doesn't care? No. <laughs> he cares more. He cares so much he's gives, giving them the free will to choose and that's what he does with us so as we participate in the divine nature and we make these choices we can access the promises now this word nature where it says we have become partakers of the divine nature it can also be translated divine order divine laws and divine force think about that you can be partakers of the divine laws, see? The laws of the Spirit, laws of, the, of God's kingdom, or the force. See? Luke Skywalker was right. Fourth is, the force is with us, right? I tell you what, there's a lot of spiritual truth in Star Wars, I'm going to tell you. I'm not saying it's a Christian movie by any means and that they got it all right. But I'm going to tell you, one of the most profound scenes that I think ever took place, if you saw Star Wars, the very first one. You know the little green guy Yoda? 
Love Yoda. He's awesome. He's trying to help Luke Skywalker learn to tap into the Force. And Luke Skywalker's on this planet with Yoda, and his ship has sunk into the swamp. And he's trying to teach him through the power of his mind to use the Force to lift the ship out of the swamp. And he'd lift it a little bit, and it'd fall back down. And Yoda, and he looks, and, and Yoda says something to him. I don't remember what, but, but Luke walks up. Listen, I'm trying. And the famous line Yoda says, there is no try. There's only do or do not. Grab hold of that. See, I didn't try to marry my wife. I married her. I didn't try to finish college. I finished college. I didn't try to drive here tonight. I drove, I drove here tonight. See, try is a word that if you're not careful, will mess you up in the kingdom because it becomes an excuse. Hey, the promise says this. I'm not going to try to grab it. I'm getting that promise. There's no try here. Man, take try out of your vocabulary. So he says, you can participate in the divine order, the divine law, through these precious promises. And guess what that does? It allows you to escape corruption. Now, (laughs) this is going to bless you right here. This is going to bless you. What does corruption really mean? Corruption means decay or ruin. Look around this world. You know that your body's decaying every day? Things that are made in this earth, they automatically begin to decay. He says, I've got some promises, and if you'll participate in my divine nature, I'll let you escape the corruption of sin. The corruption of no money. The corruption of poor health. The corruption of no future. The corruption of broken relationships. The corruption of past hurts. The corruption of thinking that you'll never amount to anything. I don't care what kind of corruption you talk about. If you will make the choice to participate in the divine nature and find a promise, you will escape that corruption. And it can begin tonight. And this is the first step, as I said, to living the abundant life. You got to get this right. You got to get the neck up checkup going. All right. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be in chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I appreciate you guys, man. I can tell you what. You know, there's sometimes, and the Pastor Paul will attest to this, there's some, sometimes when, you, when you're teaching, you just feel like it's being pulled. People, you know, and other times you feel like people are putting a wall. And I can just feel you grabbing hold of this. And again, maybe you may not understand it totally yet. That's okay. And maybe you may not quite grasp it yet. That's okay. But just keep pulling. Keep pulling. This is your first step. Your daily decision to do this will change your life. I'm telling you. All right. First Corinthians, <laughs> when I was a, some of you, may, I, mean, I know some of you know it, but some of you probably don't. Uh, I used to be a high school principal. And uh, I can remember at faculty meetings, having 60 teachers just sit there staring holes in you like, okay. We're ready to go home. We don't really care what you've got to say, so make this sweet. I mean, make this quick and sweet. And I mean, just the, the I don't know what the word is. It, it was not a fun experience because you just had things you had to cover and things you had to go over and things you had to talk to them about. And they were just sitting there like, really? Thank you for not being that way. <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, let's start in verse 9. But as it is written, as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who loved him. Now I want to tell you something. All my life I've heard most ministers teach that this is referring to what's waiting for us in heaven. It doesn't say that. Does it say that? It says, 
eye has not seen nor ear heard in the hearts of men the things God has prepared, past tense, for those who love him. But get this, verse 10. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now look now, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Have been, not going to be. This is not heaven. This is the here and now. Does that kind of sound like all things to you? Sure does to me. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who's from God, that we might know. He wants us to have this knowledge of him, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us. The things the Father gave to the Son, not just the robe, not just the ring, not just the sandal, but all the other parts of the estate that come with that. you got to know that. You got to grab hold of that. And it says that here he wants us to know and that the Spirit will reveal it to us. So as you spend time in the Word and you ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, show me what's mine. And I'm going to tell you an easy, easy way to find what's yours. Any verse that says in him or through him, that's yours. <laughs> yeah? We are more than a conqueror through him. So that person at work starts talking junk about you. Man, I'm going to grab hold of this precious promise. I'm more than a conqueror through him. I'm not going to let that bother me. Father, in fact, Father, by faith, I know my... See, God wants you to be honest. I sure don't want to pray for them because I don't like them talking about me. But as an act of faith, I'm going to pray for them right now. And I thank you that I'm more than a conqueror. Next thing you know, they're busy talking about somebody else. You know what I'm saying? So, he wants to reveal these things to us. Turn over to Romans. Romans chapter 5. Okay. Now, some of you, you might, if you've got a seatbelt on, fasten it on for a second. Put your shoulder strap on because some of you, this may cause you to tilt a little bit, okay? This may cause you to tilt if you've never heard this. It's like I do with my grandson. Got to buckle him in that car seat. Don't want him getting jostled around. So if you need me to come over and like grab hold of your shoulder now, just let me know. You know hold, hold you down. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned, who was that one man? That was Adam. By his offense, because Adam sinned, death reigned through that one much more those who receive abundance of grace, that's us, and of the gift of righteousness will get by in life. Will live an average life. Is that what it says? Those who receive the abundance of grace and of gift of righteousness will do what? Reign in life. Does it say reign in heaven? No, which we know we're going to do that. But I'm just saying in this verse does not say it's talking about right now, not heaven. Reign in life. Folks, why aren't we reigning? Why aren't we reigning in life? It's all there for us to take. It's all there for us to have. It's all there for us to own. Matter of fact, I shouldn't even say to own. We already own it. We just have to access it. Do you want to reign in life? Do you want to reign in life? Amen. Thank you. That's right. Reign. And see, remember, when we say reign, it doesn't mean rule over people. We're talking about reigning over circumstances. We're talking about reigning over the God of this world. <laughs> we're talking about bringing heaven into earth. See, that's what we're talking about. Remember that ambassador? We're talking about bringing, okay, here's my embassy. I'm bringing heaven to earth right here, wherever I go. Here's my embassy. Here's my territory. Satan, you can't cross the bloodline. What? Really? Take that little junky headache out of here. Jesus had my headaches on Calvary. You can't give them to me. It's gone. But see, if you don't know that, you'll just grab what he throws at you. We, he is, the Bible says he is under our feet. That's where he is. We reign over him. But you have to enforce it. 
you have to enforce it. See, you can have, you, 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 can, you can sit there and say all day, um, don't, don't, don't come in my yard. You know, neighbor, I don't want your dog coming in my yard. Well, you can tell them that all day, but when the dog does it and you don't do anything, who, what's the big deal? I mean, you know, nothing's working. If the dog comes over there, you've got to do something to enforce it. <laughs> That's cold. I wasn't thinking of that. No, I wasn't thinking about that. You know, you get on the phone and say, hey, neighbor, come get your dog. I said, I, I, please come get your dog. I don't want your dog in my yard. But if you don't do anything, you're not enforcing it. And then eventually say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to put a fence up over there. You're going to do what it takes to enforce if it's that important to you. This is the same thing. How important is this to you? You see, if you don't hear anything else I say tonight, the key to the kingdom of God lies in two places. Your heart and your mouth. If you don't hear anything else I say, your heart and your mouth. Change what's coming into your heart. Change what's coming out of your mouth. Your life will change. If you always talk about what you have, that's what you'll always have. If you always talk about what you have, that's what you'll have. If you talk about what he's given you, that's what you will get. Life, and we're going to get into this in the coming weeks, life and death. Excuse me. The Bible actually says death and life. He puts death first. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Remember I told you I was a high school principal. Every, every, every year, there'd be several teachers or secretaries. Well, you know, it's flu season. Guess I'm going to be catching a cold. Why are you going to catch one? Because if you're catching one, it means you're chasing it. If you, if you catch something, it means you're running after it. Why are you, why are you going to catch a cold? <laughs> you know? But anyway, and sure enough, what would happen? A few weeks later, here they are, calling in. Mr. Wall, I can't come in today. I've got, got this flu. Okay, gotcha. No. Psalm 91. No evil shall befall you, neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. Promise. Okay, I'm going to participate in the divine nature right now. Devil, no, sir. I'm going to escape that corruption of the swine flu, the bird flu, the czar flu, whatever flu there is. You're not coming in my house. And that has two meanings. My physical house, my body, but my dwelling place. You're not touching my grandson. You're not touching my wife. You're not touching my kids. You're not crossing this bloodline, Jack, in Jesus' name. Why? Because I'm an ambassador in the earth, and I've been authorized by my father. He's given me the signet ring, the robe, the sandals. I have authority. I make the decision today to exercise my authority based on his promises. Now, don't come up with some wacky thing that's not in the word. Lord, I declare today a a pound of pot's going to show up in my front door. I have authority in Jesus' name. Come on, man. He's the, <laughs> the, <laughs> in the name of Jesus, I claim that woman's wife is mine. Yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry, that man's wife is mine. <laughs> sorry. I claim that man's wife is mine. Well, that's not biblical. Come on, you can't do that. That's, the, you know, that, that violates the kingdom. But you're supposed to reign. I'm supposed to reign. You got to wake up every morning. Lord, In the name of Jesus, I choose to reign. I choose today to reign. Lord, Father, thank you for another day where I can make a difference in someone's life. Thank you that you've given me all things and that as I grow in my knowledge of you, I take hold of those precious promises today and I partake in the divine nature. I participate. I partner with your divine nature to bring those promises to pass so I escape any corruption coming my way today. That's the daily decision that you've got to make. Because you can get up and say, man, oh, I didn't sleep good last night. I don't feel good today. Oh, I don't know. There's the mouth. Watch out. Watch out. You just made the daily decision not to do this. You made the daily decision to participate with this earth's cursed system, not the kingdom of God. Two different systems. Go with me to Deuteronomy 
chapter 30. This day, you got it, brother. You are, you are on the right track. Thirty. Okay, faith, life, and blessings. And then over here, I'm going to put feelings. Death. All right. Are you students being mischievous there tonight? There. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. We're going to start in verse 11 because I want to read this through just a little bit because I want you to get this. For this commandment, this is Moses talking to the children of Israel, okay? For this commandment which I command you today is not too mysterious for you. You hear that? He says, I'm not giving you some weird thing you can't understand. He says, I'm making this really simple. It's not too mysterious for you. He says, nor is it far off. He said, it's not way over there. He said, it's right here in front of you. He said, it's not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. You don't have to go up there to get that. He said, I got it right here for you. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over over the sea and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it. He says, no. Verse 14. But the word is near you, what I say a few minutes ago? In your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. The word has to be in your mouth and in your heart. And he says, verse 15, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love your God, love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, keep his commandments, his statutes, his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away, so that you do not hear, and are drawn away, and you worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. All right, here we go. I call heaven and earth as witnesses, witnesses today against you. Okay, He says, there's a record being made in heaven right now. He says, this this is going, (laughs) we got witnesses. He says right here, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Choose life. See, it's a choice. This is what I'm talking about, the daily decision. You have a daily decision right here. According to this, you can choose to live by your feelings or what we would say our senses, the earth system, and that's going to lead you down the path to death and the curse. But here's the other choice. Right here. You can choose to Walk in faith, walk by faith, based on your instruction manual, and that's going to lead you into life and blessing. And you have to make a choice, because get this, if you don't make the choice, it's made for you. And it automatically defaults right here, as long as we live in this earth. If you don't make the choice, it automatically defaults right here. So that's why I say, now, I'm not saying I do this every single morning, but I try to. Sometimes, you know, I get in a hurry and I go and brush my teeth. Oh, sorry, Lord. Before I even roll out of bed, I've started doing this. I've started saying, Lord, thank you for giving me all things that pertain to life. I choose, and I thank you that I've gained that through the knowledge of you. I choose today to grab hold of your precious promises. I choose to be a partner in the divine nature you've given me, and I'm escaping the corruption that comes my way today. See, it's in my heart, and now I'm letting it come out of my mouth. 
And what it's doing is what we're going to talk about next week. It's framing my world. It's starting to frame my world. The Bible says that these, this world was framed by the word of God. And as we speak words, we frame our world. Okay? So, I leave you with this. Choose life, as Moses said. The daily decision is to choose life. I don't feel like it. Doesn't matter. It's an act of faith. You know, I'm, oh man, I got a two hour sleep last night. It's okay, Lord. That's my flesh talking. I choose life. I got a busy day ahead of me. I don't care. I choose life. I choose today to walk by faith and grab hold of these precious promises. So, it's there for you guys. It's there for all of us, but it's not going to fall in your lap. Remember what Jesus said? The, the, the kingdom of heaven is, um, help me out, Pastor, is, is violent, and the violent take it by force. The, 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 the yeah, suffer the violence, and, the, and, yeah, and, you, and they take it by force. You have to take it. Remember, Satan's the god of this world. He's not going to just let you stand there and do this. He's going to fight you. That's why we fight the good fight of faith. <laughs> so that's why we do this by faith, and when he comes... As long as you are enforcing it, he's got to back down. But most people don't know they can enforce it. And they say, oh, not out loud, but, in, you know, I'm just saying, come on in, Mr. Devil, just do whatever you want to do because I'm just a victim. And, you know, God's sovereign. He's on the throne. And if he wanted me to have this, he would give it to me. And if he wanted me to do this, he would help me do it. So since that's not happening, then obviously he doesn't want me to have it. That's religious mumbo jumbo. He's already given it to you. See, get past this idea of that you're waiting on God. God is waiting on you. Get past this idea about talking about your problems to God. Start talking to your problems about God. You see what I'm saying? we got to change the way we're doing things so we can exist and live in our new kingdom and prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Amen? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We ask your blessing on this time tonight. We ask you to confirm this word in the hearts and minds of the people who are here. I pray for each of my brothers and sisters that they would take this and run with it and that there will be testimony after testimony of how the kingdom of God has changed their life as they access your promises, Lord. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.